Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Rothenberg. I'm the president of the International Eosinophil Society, and it's a pleasure today to welcome you to our webinar about eosinophil imaging. Next slide, please. As way of background, the International Eosinophil Society is an organization of scientists and clinicians interested in the eosinophil, a blood cell strongly associated with many diseases. The society sponsors biennial meetings, monthly webinars, and other educational programming for its greater than 300 members. We review new information about the eosinophil, and we provide a dialogue for individuals to collaborate and expand on their knowledge and collaborations to better understand and treat eosinophil diseases. If you're interested in becoming a, a member of the society or joining our mailing list, please visit our website. You can use this QR code to go directly to the website. It's important also, I want to emphasize that we're very excited to also welcome the European Mass Cell and Basal Research Network as a partner organization. And we're soon going to be having joint membership where you pay one price and get membership in both societies. We're also offering free membership for early career individuals. We use a broad definition of that. So consider whether or not uh, that would apply to you. Free membership um, is available typically for st all students, healthcare personnel, doctorate candidates, postdocs, and fellows, and certainly junior faculty. Use this QR code to join if, for the free membership. Next slide. We're also featuring on our website a recently initiated um, process where we are reviewing articles of interest to the field. These are typically reviewed by our committee, many composed of early stage career um, individuals, and the articles are summarized on the website. You can check this out also with this QR code. And we recently reviewed an article that was just published in PNAS entitled Nutrient Derived Signals Regular Eosinophil Adaptation to the Small Intestine. And this is a very exciting article. It's been reviewed by Krishan Jiba. And I uh, encourage you to read about how uh, we have uh, reviewed this this cutting edge article that was just published. Next slide. By the way, if you're interested in nominating articles for review, please don't hesitate to let me or anyone else in the office know about that. I want to remind you to save the date for the 13th biennial symposium, which is scheduled in for July of 2025 in Montpellier, France. The program is now under development and it's very exciting to see how many people are participating in the committee that's planning this meeting. And indeed, an exciting program is evolving. Next slide. I'd like to thank our corporate advisory councils, number of companies that have um, been sponsoring the society, and uh, we're very pleased to partner with them. Thank you very much. Today, I'm pleased to have uh, two excellent moderators. Professor Nivis Zimman from the United States, also a member of the university where I am, located at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She'll be the primary moderator today, along with our, um, our initiative to involve early stage trainees. And I'm pleased that Dr. Eva Gruden, who's a postdoctorate trainee at the University of Granz in Austria, will also be participating. So I'd like to turn the floor over now to Nivis. Please, Nivis. Good morning. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, moderate uh, or co-moderate with uh, Dr. Gruden this um, webinar this morning. We have a fantastic lineup, uh, but we'll start with some housekeeping items uh, to how this will work, for especially for those who have not participated in our, our webinars before. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, button to ask any questions uh, during the presentation. Uh, you will then we will read the questions to the speakers. If there's a lot of questions, we might prioritize one or two questions depending on the time. 
However, the speakers will have an opportunity to respond to the remainder of the questions offline later on. Um, so don't worry about that. The questions will be answered. Um, on the other hand, uh, the attendees are muted and the chat feature is disabled. So the only way really to communicate and ask questions is the Q&A uh, button. So please use that. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the IES website. So if there's something you want to get back to or um, and re-review or if you are unable to see the whole thing today um, or, it, or uh, any of our past uh, webinars are also available on our on our website um, and on our YouTube channel. So please use that resource as well. And then for those who uh, are interested, there is a closed captioning uh, button available um, as well on the bottom of your screen. So with that, uh, our lineup for today, we have some fantastic speakers. I will introduce them one by one right before uh, their uh, talks, uh, but we will be talking for everything from uh, light microscopy to electron microscopy of eosinophils and then trafficking, not um, like tracking eosinophils in the tissue and some really, really cutting edge um, approaches to viewing eosinophils and uh, what they're doing. So be prepared for five excellent talks that are coming up. And um, with that, I think I will um, go ahead and introduce the first speaker. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Margaret Collins. Uh, she's a, a colleague and, and mentor and role model of mine. She's a professor of pathology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and the uh, University of Cincinnati. And uh, she her work has focused on uh, pathology of uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases, and she's the central pathology reviewer for Seeger and really a leader in the field. Um, and so with that, I would like to give the stage to Dr. Collins. Um, and I think I'm giving you two extra minutes by ending my part early. So Margaret, take it. Thank you, um, Nivis, for your very kind um, introduction and the extra two minutes. <laughs> Um, so I look forward to the following talks that I think will be very elegant. Uh, this talk will focus on identifying eosinophils in tissue sections using the ordinary stain, the common, commonly used stain in um, pathology, the hematoxylin and eosin stain. And the uh, for decades now, the, the gold standard of the pathology portion of the clinical pathologic diagnosis of eosinophil esophagitis has been a peak eosinophil count. Um, we've met with varied success in persuading pathologists um, to uh, count eosinophils in tissue sections. I think increasing numbers of pathologists do that. There are still pathologists who do not provide a peak eosinophil count, although that is the metric used for diagnosis, and it's been the metric used in clinical trials and also for whether there's remission and so on. So a group of uh, pathologists with experience in um, identifying eosinophils and tissue sections realized that now that we are dealing increasingly with non-EOE EGIPs, uh, EO, eosinophilic gastritis and eosinophilic duodenitis in particular, that there are challenges to trying to quantify eosinophils in those tissues that we don't see in the esophagus, partly because eosinophils are resident in those tissues and partly because the architecture of those tissues is much more complicated than in the esophagus. And so the group got together and in uh, the American Journal of Surgical Pathology in 2022, published a primer intended to encourage pathologists um, to count eosinophils in places other than the esophagus. And we began with the ideal specimen. And the ideal specimen is one in which the surface epithelium is at one edge of the 
biopsy piece and the muscularis mucosa is at the opposing edge of the biopsy piece. This is a section of the antrum of the stomach, and this is a section of the fundus or the body um, of the stomach containing what's also called oxyntic um, type mucosa. And here, of course, is the um, duodenum with the villus uh, architecture. Excuse me. Um, and uh, this, I don't agree with, even though I was part of this group. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine to count two areas of the same piece of tissue. Just don't want to be counting the same high power field in multiple levels, but non-overlapping um, areas of the same piece of tissue, is, it's fine to count um, there. And the uh, circle here is demarcating a high power field. I agree that um, even in the stomach and the duodenum, as in the esophagus, we are counting eosinophils um, that uh, are not in the muscularis mucosa or in the submucosa. If the eosinophils are counted in those areas, they should be tallied uh, separately. And so here they are. Um, the solid circles demarcate the structures that we agreed a majority uh, would be counted as eosinophils, and the dashed lines indicate structures that the majority believed should not be counted as eosinophils. This is nice. This is definitely an eosinophil. There are two lobes. You can see the little bridge between the two lobes. There are lots of eosinophil of granules around. There isn't a cell border, um, but it's still an eosinophil. It's one that's degranulated or at least disrupted. Same here, a darkly staining lobe of an eosinophil nucleus associated with granules, ditto here. This represents a group of eosinophils that we don't know whether it's part of a cell or not. So the tradition has been not to quantify uh, or include those in counts of eosinophils. Here again is a nice example, I believe, of an eosinophil darkly staining uh, eosinophil lobes or lobes of the eosinophil nucleus. Here, the nucleus is not right for an eosinophil, even for a lobe of an eosinophil nucleus. There are way too many, probably nucleoli, in that nucleus, and, and you don't see that, you hardly ever see that, a nucleolus in an eosinophil nucleus, let alone a bunch of them. This is a uh, phenomenon in which an eosinophil, maybe this one, has deposited eosinophils extracellularly, and they are deposited on top of uh, another type of cell. So uh, that should not uh, be counted. This is okay to count. This is a, a nice example also of an eosinophil. This one I'd want to focus up and down through um, planes of section um, to be sure that this is a darkly staining, probably lobe of eosinophil. But right now I'd say chances are greater than 50-50 that that really is an eosinophil. This should not be counted. Um, this nucleus looks like an edge of that nucleus or part of that nucleus. It doesn't look like an eosinophil nucleus. And so that then constitutes a, a group of eosinophils that are extracellular, and we don't include those traditionally in counts of eosinophils. This one would give me pause. Again, they aren't as darkly staining as you would like the lobes of an eosinophil to be, but probably I would count that. This is uh, an extracellular group that's associated with something that's not an eosinophil nucleus or lobe of an eosinophil nucleus. This looks good for an eosinophil. No, this looks too much like the other nuclei that are in cells uh, in this field and not an eosinophil nucleus. Um, so I would not count that. So I was an outlier on that one. Um, and this one, we all agreed, I believe, that we would not count because it, it looks um, not good enough to be, um, not dark enough to be an eosinophil nucleus. Okay. Okay. They have a different, excuse me, they have a different shape um, from uh, normal, uh, from what you usually see. This one is probably okay. And this one, no, these are these whatever those cells are, those are those nuclei. And this again is an example of eosinophils having been deposited in and near um, cells that are not uh, eosinophils. 
it's okay. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'm not enthusiastic about that one, but I'd probably count it. Definitely not. Uh, and that's one that we all agreed on uh, during this exercise. Yes, it's darkly staining. It's not round, but, you know, they move through uh, blood vessel walls. They move through tissue. They probably do change shape while they're doing that. This is okay, and uh, this one is not. Uh, and this one probably is okay. It looks like there's a nucleus um, in here. Then, uh, you know, if, if we could um, focus in and out of a few planes of section, we might be able to convince ourselves, and probably would, that it's a darkly staining lobe of an eosinophil nucleus, and that would be um, okay to count. So there may not be a right and a wrong answer for some structures and the best we can do, and I think it's it's fine, is to be internally consistent and use the same criterion from case to case for what we count and what we don't um, count. Sorry, um, so how to count. Uh, this is a very poorly oriented um, high power or, or field uh, on the left um, here. Uh, but looking at it at a low power, you don't see any eosinophils. Once you get to a higher power, there certainly are eosinophils in there, and I can't recount how many times I have looked at cells at, at uh, excuse me, at slides at 40x and thought, oh, there's nothing going on here. And by the time I get to 200x, I don't think you have to go up to 400, but an intermediate power, I see that I was wrong. And there really are numerous, uh, too numerous, eosinophils in an area of the biopsy. This poorly oriented high power or field would be very difficult to count accurately. Um, one method would be to put a grid in an eyepiece and use the grid to count from one uh, area of the grid to another. I think I would get nauseous myself um, trying to count in a in a circular um, manner. The uh, lawnmower method is um, one that is helpful in some instances. I'm not sure how helpful it would be in cases like this where the orientation is just terrible and it, it is um, frustrating, but you do your best to try to count each eosinophil there, that's there only once. Um, and so the lawnmower uh, method is one that is nicely applied when there is good orientation of the uh, crypts, and it makes it easier. You, you've, got land, you've got landmarks, uh, and, and you can easily remember where you are. So in this area of the uh, body of the stomach, um, there's an illustration of eosinophils in the middle portion of the stomach, but really just as easily as in the antrum. Um, eosinophils can accumulate in the body portion of the stomach right under the surface epithelium or more deeply um, in the tissue sections. There really isn't a band of eosinophils um, seen here in this duodenum, but the crypt has terminated above the muscularis mucosa. That's an abnormality. And when that happens, it's not uncommon in highly inflamed uh, duodenal mucosa um, to find eosinophils that are uh, in increased numbers in the uh, area between the crypt and the muscularis mucosa. It's also not uncommon to find the most number of eosinophils in a biopsy in the intravillous lamina propria as opposed to the intercryptal um, lamina propria. So that needs to be um, borne in mind. So trying to count eosinophils in an, uh, an area like this is um, is treacherous, <laughs> but one way uh, to try to do it, uh, because there there aren't distinct cell borders uh, around many of these cells, is to try to find two lobes, and where there's two lobes, that means one eosinophil. Um, that's one way to approach um, trying to obtain a, as accurate a number of eosinophils as possible in areas in which there's a lot of uh, disruption of the eosinophils. So additional pathology is found in uh, both the stomach and the duodenum when they're heavily inflamed with eosinophils. Uh, loss of mucin is one of those um, abnormalities. Here are sheets of uh, eosinophils occupying um, the lamina propria. There are reactive epithelial changes, um, including nuclear enlargement uh, and nuclei that are no longer resting along the um, bottom of the cell. 
in the duodenum, there can be flattening of the uh, villi. And here, there's termination of uh, villi above the muscularis uh, mucosa. And a good number of uh, eosinophils occupy um, that area. There is crypt elongation, uh, excuse me, also in that um, area. So one of the things that um, we need to be very aware of, uh, especially in the duodenum uh, or in the small intestine in general on the right part of the colon, is that there are cells that are normally found there called panis cells. And those cells have red granules in their cytoplasm. Generally, they're more pink than eosinophil granules are, and they're larger than eosinophil granules are. So with a nice H and E stain, there usually is not a problem distinguishing one um, from the other, but you find eosinophils inside um, the crypts in, uh, in, in biopsies that are um, heavily inflamed. Um, also, as mentioned before, there can be granules on cells that are not um, eosinophils and uh, also, of course, in the uh, out in the lamina propria. Uh, one reason that we have not focused on those is it's hard to quantify such a change other than it's there or it's not. And virtually always um, extracellular granules are, are found. Uh, but this study from some years ago um, quantified uh, in, in, uh, in a simple manner um, how many uh, or how often um, the granules appeared to be more aggregated extracellular eosinophil granules at the edge of the biopsy compared to the center of the biopsy. And it, was, it happened uh, throughout the GI tract, implying that, in fact, the act of obtaining the biopsy, normal biopsy tissue, these were all histologically normal biopsies, even obtaining normal tissue with normal numbers of uh, eosinophils and then can cause a mechanical disruption um, at the edge of the tissue. And so finally, um, the are, there are now guidelines for non-EOE EGID um, in pediatrics uh, published in January in the Journal of the Pediatric Gastroenterology and uh, Nutrition, uh, a, a statement that was considered to have um, a low evidence, but uh, was agreed upon by most of the numerous people who uh, engaged in this effort to make uh, criteria for non-EOE agents in children, included eosinophil glandulitis and eosinophil cryptitis, additional pathologic changes that should be present uh, when making a diagnosis of non-EOE agent. And here are the peak eosinophil count, one high power field, not multiple high power fields are recommended. Uh, and these are the numbers that uh, per high power field that, that were recommended. Some might be too small. I think that's really accurate. Um, these others we'll find out with time. Maybe they're a little too high, maybe not. But uh, as we use them, we'll come to uh, realize whether they are. It got strong agreement. It doesn't mean that we're right about that. But So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to... Uh, to entertain any uh, questions, and I know I need to stop shooting. Thank you very much um, uh, for this great overview. Uh, one, we have one question in the chat uh, from Dr. Ackerman. Considering the difficulties in identifying and counting intact eosinophils and excluding eosinophils that have probably degranulated, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make more sense to quantify using a biomarker for eosinophil granules and their proteins to get a more comprehensive estimate of eosinophil involvement in the tissue of interest? So that's a very good question. Thank you, um, Steve. I'm not sure if anyone else will be um, addressing this, but it doesn't overcome the um, issue of whether the granules are there um, by uh, by mechanical disruption or whether the granules are there by active extrusion um, from the cells. So uh, identifying them doesn't mean that they're there for pathological reasons or not. Mm -hmm. That's one reason. Another reason is uh, for clinical work, um, that's very, 
it's costly and uh, insurance companies won't pay um, for that kind of immunohistochemical um, analysis. So that's another practical reason that um, that's not used for clinical um, evaluations. And just one more very quick question. Do you think the threshold for diagnosis of EGITS differs in children and adults? Uh, not in the esophagus. Um, maybe in the rest of the GI tract. Uh, and that's a very good question that we'll keep in mind as we're constructing uh, criteria for um, the rest of the, I'm, I'm sorry, for the adult um, stomach and duodenum. There is an effort now um, to do that, and we will try as best we can to determine if there's a reason to think that that is the case now that we've got this uh, tremendous amount of work done on the pediatric end, um, and we hopefully we'll be able to make some comparisons and come to some conclusions about whether we should be using the same numbers or different numbers. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mello. She's a professor of cell and molecular biology, uh, and she did her postdoctoral training uh, at Harvard Medical School, um, where she got interested in eosinophils and has since then had a distinguished career exploring cellular mechanisms underlying inflammation and eosinophil biology and doing some really innovative electron microscopy techniques to look at um, cellular ultrastructure of eosinophils and correlate that to uh, their function. Um, but I will let her uh, explain that in detail for us. Um, I also want to comment that uh, she does a great job putting together science and arts. Some of the pictures are really uh, gorgeous and I, I look forward to your talk. With that, take it, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we're good. Can you see me? Looks great. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to talk about my preferred cell. Eosinophils are not good, not only by their um, collection of immune mediators found mostly preformed in their granules, but also by their unique morphology. While the highly acidophilic nature of eosinophil granules are classically used to detect the cells by light microscopy, as beautiful mode showed by Dr. Collins, uh, the ultra structure of these cells enables their precise identification at high resolution. And this is because using a few grains show electron dense core surrounded by um, a less dense matrix features found only only in using the fields when visualized under the transmission electron microscope in humans and other species. So this ultrastructural signature is of great interest to understand eosinophils and health and disease, especially because eosinophils granules are extensively released in vivo through cytolytic degranulation, as you can see on the screen, remaining intact inflammatory sites in a wide variety of eosinophil associated diseases. So by applying EM, we don't need to use any specific labeling to detect eosinophils. The simple find of eosinophil granules in a tissue site like this one, they find the presence of eosinophils, even if you find a single granule, for example, in an inflamed uh, intestine, as you can see on the screen, plenty of charcoal crystals 
which are considered markers of inflammation, uh, we can definitely come to the conclusion that eosinophils stopped by. So the architecture of eosinophils is so unique that in addition to specific granules, eosinophils have a very active vesicular system with um, a distinct morphology, the sombrero vesicles, which are, are promptly identified by TM. I'm used to say that specific granules and sombrero give personality to human eosinophils. So sombrero vesicles show a high plasticity and they have incredible ability to interact with and bud from secretory gran granules. And this is because sombreros are involved in the transport of immune mediators. So for over 20 years, our group has been applying EM techniques to understand the architecture and functions of eosinophils and humans and mouse models, especially during cell activation. So we use a combination of EM techniques, conventional TM, immunogold EM, electron tomography, which is a, a, a TM technique that retrieves three-dimensional information and the quantitative approaches that altogether um, enable, are very useful to demonstrate the cell activated, activation status with important insights into the eosinophil capabilities. So our studies are focused on understanding the structural organization of eosinophils, for example, how immune mediators are compartmentalized in the cytoplasm and biological processes such as cell secretion, vesicular trafficking, cell death, and the behavior of several organelles uh, in response to activation, include, including mitochondria. It's a, a very recent find from our group. There are remarkable ultrastructural differences between resting and activated eosinophils. In response to eosinophil activation, organelles can change their morphology, organelles and vesicles can be formed, organelles can interact with other organelles, and all of these ultrastructural aspects can be quantitated. So, in addition to have a qualitative image analysis, we, it's very important to have a quantitative, to, to have a quantitative analysis. What I mean is that qualitative analysis, you are able to capture the phenomenon, but it's also important to measure this phenomenon. So our studies are always um, directed at gaining a quantitative understanding of structural changes and behavioral shifts because it is important to characterize different aspects of eosinophil activation. So now let's take a brief look at the events going on inside the activated eosinophils, very briefly at a glance, captured by EF. First, structural changes of granules. Eosinophil granules undergo spectacular changes in activated eosinophils associated with degranulation. So, uh, EM, you can reveal a profusion of morphological changes from initial disarrangement of the core and matrix up to more advanced stages. EM enables uh, electron uh, microscopy enables not only the identification of different levels of granule content losses, but also the definition if these losses are happening in parallel or not with fusion events. If granule fusion predominate in the cytoplasm, define compound exocytosis. If not, piscinal degranulation, a vesicle-based uh, mechanisms of secretion is taking place. In vivo, as extensively demonstrated by previous, wor previous works, eosinophil secrete mostly through piecemeal degranulation, as you can see on the screen, and cytolysis. So in one side, just a field, the same field, you see three in, in pink eosinophils undergoing piecemeal and three extracellular granules. 
The second uh, event associated with uh, use of ion activation is increased formation of sombrero vesicles. You can, electron tomography was very informative to capture this phenomenon from granules. So uh, I don't have time to go through the technique. This is a fantastic technique because you have serial slices. There are, you can see on the right, uh, representative serial slices. They are combined in a tomogram and you have this uh, result. So sombrero vesicles, you can capture this increase both in vitro when you use different stimuli or in vivo. This is an electron micrograph from a patient with hyperosinophilic syndrome. And if you compare just in one infection, uh, there are, there are um, significant because hyperosinophilic syndrome is naturally activated. So if you compare with health donor, there are more, much more significant increase of sombrero vesicles in hyperosinophilic uh, uh, blood eosinophils. So another event associated with activation and lipid drop biogenesis and accumulation. So it's very well known that lipid droplets, also termed lipid bodies, are sites for the synthesis of inflammatory mediators. All the machinery is inside uh, lipid droplets, arachidonic acid, and under activation, it's, this acid is arachidonic acid is released, and uh, enzymes are expressed, and eicosanoids are formed inside the lipid body. So by EM, it's not surprising that when you analyze um, eosinophils by EM, you can see just in one section. I'm, at, I'm at drawing attention for this because this thin section is just 80 nanometer of thickness. And you can see several lipid bodies and easy to see lipid bodies by EM because in eosinophils, they are very electron dense. So you can capture even very small lipid bodies. And um, this previous one was activated by stimuli, but in vivo, you can see in one tissue section, this from Crohn's disease, you see in an inflammatory um, infiltrate, a lymphocyte, a mast cell, and a eosinophil with three lipid bodies uh, denoting this increased formation. So one interesting aspect of lipid bodies is that captured just by EM is that lipid bodies can change electron density. It's so amazing because for instance, you can see this human eosinophils cultured with HIV, plenty full of lipid bodies, different sizes. By EM, you can capture the increase in, in size and even fuse the lipid bodies that we can see by our heads. And lipid bodies just uh, change the electron density, which means that this change is reflecting inflammation associated molecular events within lipid droplets. So uh, the next um, event associated with using of your activation captured by EM is amplified formation of extra, extracellular vesicles. So we have an approach in which the extracellular vesicles are studied in cross-cell sections showing the entire cell profile, nucleus, and intact plasma membrane. So you can capture EVs, nascent EVs at the cell surface, so our approach, if you use different, the type of stimulus impacts the production and size of EVs. And one advantage to use EM is that you can see by this drawing that you can capture free extracellular vesicles at the cell surface and also EVs being formed from the plasma membrane. So there is, we um, got the results and published this, that there is a notable increase in the number of EVs at various variety stages of budding from the plasma membrane. Another event associated with using of fuel activation is mitochondrial remodeling. Um, we recently published a paper showing that eosinophil mitochondria and in eosinophils are responding to activation. So we don't have time to go through all the information. I have three key messages um, about this uh, study. 
So we use mouse models of disease, asthma, uh, influenza, and schistosomiasis mansoni, and we observe that first key message, mitochondria reshape their crystal in activators in the field. So we study by quantitative studies the, the several types of, of, of uh, crystal, and you, um, you see when the, the, the tissue, the, depending on the disease, the proportion of the type of the crystal change. The second message, key message from these studies, this study is that mitochondria change their crystal numbers and volume and activated those nofils, depending, increasing or decreasing, depending on the disease. You can see in this graph that asthma induce uh, increased um, numbers of, of, of um, crystal, but um, influenza, there is a decrease, schistosomize, there is an increase. And the third trick, tri the third key message, <laughs> mitochondria establish, establish an interaction with the other organelles. One that drew our attention was the interaction with granules. You can see that all diseases increase the number of this interaction. It's, of, it's very new, it's a very open field. Then potentially, this mitochondrial interaction can regulate eosinophil immune functions, um, including secretion of the high immune response. So finally, I'd like to highlight very briefly that specific nuclear changes constitute early signs of HOs in activated eosinophils. We have provided for the first time the ultrastructural signature of HOs in vivo, defining early and late signs of etiosis, meaning early what happening before the release of extracellular um, traps. And by learning about the ultrastructure of activated eosinophils, you can diagnose, for example, that in the same field you have on the left one eosinophil undergoing etiosis, I know by the nuclear changes, and on the right, one is no few undergoing piecemeal degranulation. So it's help, very helpful to understand the functionalities of using the in addition to be very beautiful. So in summary, I will not read all of this. Electron microscopy applied to eosinophil studies enables to identify eosinophils and their interactions, enable precise identification of secretion process, provide an insightful panorama of activated eosinophils in vitro and in vivo. So um, my, I'd like to thank my fantastic group in Brazil. This is a big self in my lab. And also I'd like to thank my collaborators uh, in Brazil and abroad, and especially Peter Weller, who introduced me to this fantastic world of eosinophils. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Uh, and it has generated a lot of questions, but we are a little bit off time. So I'm maybe going to pick one or two. Um, and then uh, if we can, if you could answer others later, please. Um, so one question was, uh, what about mouth eosinophils? Do they have the vesicular tubular system, sombrero vesicles, and maybe broadly, um, what are some of the differences between mouse eosinophils and human eosinophils in electron microscopy? Uh, this is a very good question. Thanks for raising this point. Um, mouse eosinophils do have a vesicular tubular system composed of uh, large round vesicles and tubular profiles, but they don't show clear the sombrero vesicle, the sombrero, I mean the Mexican hat aspect. So you cannot say that these vesicles are sombrero, they are sombrero-like. And I'm saying that are, they are sombrero-like because they behave like human sombrero vesicles. For instance, if you activate the cells uh, both in vivo and in vitro, the number of this vesicular tubular um, system increases. We have, we had um, 
we have quantitated the number of these vesicles in eosinophils taking part in uh, schistosomized mansoni, and then there is increased. And we labeled these vesicles with MBP. So mouse behavior, uh, the sombrero vesicles, you have a sombrero-like, you can say. The difference, you have subtle difference between the ultrastructure of eosinophil human and mouse eosinophils. Um, one, you can say, um, this is one, the sombrero. Another one is the, the granules have, although the granules have the core, the electron dense, but the format, it's a little bit different. I mean, it's more uh, elongated. And uh, um, mouse using the fields do not degranulate in the same rate and so easily compared to human using the fields. So you have to be very um, use quantitative, an quantitative analysis to measure if they are able to degranulate, but human using the fields it's just easily degranulated. So another difference you can, it's about the nucleus. The nucleus of mouse eosinophils are more polymorphic compared and ring shaped compared to, um, to human eosinophils. I can list other differences, but I mm -hmm. think it's, I don't have time <laughs> to talk <laughs> about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I'm sorry, I have to cut off the rest of the questions for now uh, so we can get back on time. And so Dr. Gooden will introduce the next speaker, please. Thank you. I look forward to introducing our next speaker, and that's Dr. Jonathan Sevier, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the Technion. He received his PhD in theoretical physics of complex systems from the Weizmann Institute, and he did his postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School. During his work, he has received many prestigious awards, such as the Lee Seagull Prize for the Theoretical Biology, the Allen Fellowship, and the American Federation for Aging Research Young Investigator Award. He has vast experience in harnessing AI for health applications, so I look especially forward to his talk today, where he will talk about using AI to identify eosinophil disease features and improve treatment assignment. Please start. Okay, thank you, Eva, for the kind introduction. There's no Zoom meeting without glitches in sharing and muting. So uh, uh, let me just try to share again. Okay, so again, thank you, Eva, and thanks for the organizers for uh, letting me the opportunity to uh, present our work here. Such wonderful things about isonophils, really, really exciting. So, so I guess all of you heard about AI, especially in the recent uh, months where the uh, GPT uh, and generative AI has exploded. And actually, AI in medicine is, is, is already uh, making a difference for, 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 for a few years now, actually. You can see here just an example of the already FDA-approved AI-based algorithms. Uh, there are hundreds already, and we are still keep going. But um, I, I just want to dedicate a few minutes just to uh, uh, ask, what do we need AI for, and, and what are the challenges? Can so, I interrupt you for a second? Uh, is sure. it possible to change to presentation mode, please? Oh, um, I think I am in presentation mode. Um, um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mello. She's a professor of cell and molecular biology. Uh, and she did her postdoctoral training uh, at Harvard Medical School. Um, where she got interested in eosinophils and has since then had a distinguished career exploring cellular mechanisms underlying inflammation and eosinophil biology and doing some really innovative electron microscopy techniques to look at um, cellular ultrastructure of eosinophils and correlate that to uh, their function. 
Um, but I will let her uh, explain that in detail for us. Um, I also want to comment that uh, she does a great job putting together science and arts. Some of the pictures are really uh, gorgeous and I, I look forward to your talk. With that, take it, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we're good. Can you see me? Looks great. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to talk about my preferred cell. Eosinophils are notable, not only by their um, collection of immune mediators found mostly preformed in their granules, but also by their unique morphology. While the highly acidophilic nature of eosinophil granules are classically used to detect these cells by light microscopy, as beautiful showed by Dr. Collins, uh, the outer structure of these cells enables their precise identification at a high resolution. And this is because using a few grains show an um, electron dense core surrounded by um, a less dense matrix, features found only only in using fields when visualized under the transmission electron microscope in humans and other species. So this ultra-structural signature is of great interest to understand eosinophils and health and disease, especially because eosinophil granules are extensively re released in vivo through cytolytic degranulation, as you can see on the screen, remaining intact inflammatory sites in a wide variety of eosinophil associated diseases. So by applying EM, we don't need to use any specific labeling to detect eosinophils. The simple find of eosinophil granules in a tissue site like this one, they find the presence of eosinophils, even if you find a single granule, for example, in an inflamed uh, intestine, as you can see on the screen, plenty of charcoal crystals, which are considered markers of inflammation, uh, we can definitely come to the conclusion that eosinophils stopped by. So the architecture of eosinophils is so unique that in addition to specific granules, eosinophils have a very active vesicular system with um, a distinct morphology, the sombrero vesicles, which are, are promptly identified by TM. I'm used to say that specific granules and sombrero give personality to human eosinophils. So sombrero vesicles, show a high plasticity and they have incredible ability to interact with and bud from secretory gran granules. And this is because sombreros are involved in the transport of immune mediators. So for over 20 years, our group has been applying EM techniques to understand the architecture and functions of eosinophils in humans and mouse models, especially during cell activation. So we use a combination of EM techniques, conventional TM, immunogold EM, electron tomography, which is a, a, a TM technique that retrieves three-dimensional information and the quantitative approaches that altogether um, enable are very useful to demonstrate the cell activated activation status with important insights into the eosinophil capabilities. So our studies are focused on understanding the 
structural organization of eosinophils, for example, how immune mediators are compartmentalized in the cytoplasm, and biological processes such as cell secretion, vesicular trafficking, cell death, and the behavior of several organelles uh, in response to activation, include, including mitochondria. It's a, a very recent find from our group. There are remarkable ultrastructural differences between resting and activated eosinophils. In response to eosinophil activation, organelles can change their morphology, organelles and vesicles can be formed, organelles can interact with other organelles, and all of these ultrastructural aspects can be quantitated. So, in addition to have a qualitative image analysis, we, it's very important to have a quantitative to to have a quantitative analysis. What I mean is that qualitative analysis you are able to capture the phenomenon, but it's also important to measure this phenomenon. So our studies are always um, directed at gaining a quantitative understanding of structural changes and behavioral shifts because it is important to characterize different aspects of eosinophil activation. So now let's take a brief look at the events going on inside the activated eosinophils, very briefly at a glance, captured by EF. First, structural changes of granules. Eosinophil granules undergo spectacular changes in activated eosinophils associated with degranulation. So, uh, EM, you can reveal a profusion of morphological changes from initial disarrangement of the core and matrix up to more advanced stages. EM enables uh, electron uh, microscopy enables not only the identification of different levels of granule content losses, but also the definition if these losses are happening in parallel or not with fusion events. If granule fusion predominates in the cytoplasm, define compound exocytosis. If not, piecemeal degranulation, a vesicle-based uh, mechanisms of secretion is taking place. In vivo, as extensively demonstrated by previous, wor previous works, eosinophils secrete mostly through piecemeal degranulation, as you can see on the screen, and cytolysis. So in one side, just a field, the same field, you see three in, in pink eosinophils undergoing piecemeal and three extracellular granules. The second uh, event associated with uh, Using of your activation is increased the formation of sombrero vesicles. You can, electron tomography was very informative to capture this phenomenon from granules. So uh, I don't have time to go through the technique. This is a fantastic technique because you have serial slices. There are, you can see on the right, uh, representative serial slices. They are combined in a tomogram and you have this uh, result. So sombrero vesicles, you can capture this increase both in vitro when you use different stimuli or in vivo. This is an electron micrograph from a patient with hyperosinophilic syndrome. And if you compare just in one infection, uh, there are, there are an significant because hyperosinophilic syndrome is naturally activated. So if you compare with health donor, there are more, much more significant increase of sombrero vesicles in hyperosinophilic uh, uh, blood eosinophils. So another event associated with activation is lipid drop biogenesis and accumulation. So it's very well known that lipid droplets, also termed lipid bodies, are sites for the synthesis of inflammatory mediators. All the machinery is inside uh, lipid droplets, arachidonic acid, and under activation, it's, this acid is arachidonic acid is released, and uh, enzymes are expressed, and eicosanoids are formed inside the lipid bodies. So by EM, 
it's not surprising that when you analyze um, using of fields by M, you can see just in one section. I'm at, I'm at drawing attention for this because this thick section is just 80 nanometer of thickness, and you can see several lipid bodies and easy to see lipid bodies by M because in eosinophils, they are very electron dense. So you can capture even very small lipid bodies. And um, this previous one was activated by stimuli, but in vivo, you can see in one tissue section, this from Crohn's disease, you see in an inflammatory um, infiltrate, a lymphocyte, a mast cell, and a eosinophil with three lipid bodies uh, denoting this increased formation. So one interesting aspect of lipid bodies is that captured just by EM is that lipid bodies can change electron density. It's so amazing because, for instance, you can see this human eosinophils cultured with HIV, plenty full of lipid bodies, different sizes. By M, you can capture the increase in, in size and even fuse the lipid bodies that we can see by our heads. And lipid bodies just uh, change the electron density, which means that this change is reflecting inflammation associated molecular events within lipid droplets. So uh, the next... Um, event associated with eosinophil activation captured by EMs, amplified formation of extra, extracellular vesicles. So we have an approach in which extracellular vesicles are studied in cross-cell sections, showing the entire cell profile, nucleus, and intact plasma membrane. So you can capture EVs, nascent EVs at the cell surface, so our approach, if you use different, the type of stimulus impacts the production and size of EVs. And one advantage to use EM is that you can see by this drawing that you can capture free extracellular vesicles at the cell surface and also EVs being formed from the plasma membrane. So there is we um, got the results and published this, that there is a notable increase in the number of EVs at various variety stages of budding from the plasma membrane. Another event associated with using of fuel activation is mitochondrial remodeling. Um, we recently published a paper showing that using of fuel, mitochondria and in using of fuels are responding to activation. So we don't have time to go through all the information. I have three key messages um, about this uh, study. So we use mouse models of disease, asthma, uh, influenza, and schistosomiasis mansoni. And we observe that first key message, mitochondria reshape their crystal in activators in the field. So we studied by quantitative studies, the, the several types of, of, of uh, crystal. And you, um, you see when the, the, the tissue, the, depending on the disease, the proportion of the type of the crystal change. The second message, key message from these studies, this study is that mitochondria change their crystal numbers and volume and activated eosinophils depending, increasing or decreasing depending on the disease. You can see in this graph that asthma induces uh, increased um, numbers of, of, of um, crystal, but um, influenza, there is a decrease, schistosomiasis there is an increase. And the, the third three, three, the third key message, <laughs> mitochondria establish, establish um, interaction with the other organelles. One that drew our attention was the interaction with the granules. You can see that all disease increases the number of this interaction. It's, of, it's very new, it's a very open field. Then potentially this mitochondrial interaction can regulate eosinophil immune functions. Um, including secretion of the high immune response. So finally, I'd like to highlight very briefly that specific nuclear changes 
constitute early signs of HOs in activated osinophils. We have provided for the first time the ultrastructural signature of HOs in vivo, defining early and late signs of etiosis, meaning early what happening before the release of extracellular um, traps. And by learning about the ultrastructure of activated eosinophils, you can diagnose, for example, that in the same field, you have on the left one eosinophil undergoing etiosis, I know by the nuclear changes, and on the right, one is no few undergoing piecemeal degranulation. So it's help, very helpful to understand the functionalities of using no fuels. In addition, to be very beautiful. So in summary, I will not read all of this. Electron microscopy applied to using no few studies enables to identify using no fuels and their interactions, enable precise identification of secretion process, provide insightful panorama of activated osinophils in vitro and in vivo. So um, my, I'd like to thank my fantastic group in Brazil. This is a big self in my lab. And also I'd like to thank my collaborators uh, in Brazil and abroad, and especially Peter Weller, who introduced me to this fantastic world of osinophils. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Uh, and it has generated a lot of questions, but we are a little bit off time. So I'm maybe gonna pick one or two. Um, and then uh, if we can, if you could answer others later, please. Um, so one question was, uh, what about mouth eosinophils? Do they have the vesicular tubular system, sombrero vesicles, and maybe broadly, um, what are some of the differences between mouse eosinophils and human eosinophils in electron microscopy? Uh, this is a very good question. Thanks for raising this point. Um, mouse eosinophils do have a vesicular tubular system composed of uh, large round vesicles and tubular profiles, but they don't show clear the sombrero vesicle, the sombrero, I mean the Mexican hat aspect. So you cannot say that these vesicles are sombrero, they are sombrero-like. And I'm saying that are, they are sombrero-like because they behave like human sombrero vesicles. For instance, if you activate the cells uh, both in vivo and in vitro, the number of this vesicular tubular um, system increase. We have, we had, um, we have quantitated the number of these vesicles in eosinophils taking part in uh, schistosomized mansoni, and then there is increased. And we labeled these vesicles with MBP. So mouse behavior, uh, the sombrero vesicles, you have a sombrero-like, you can say. The difference, you have subtle difference between the ultrastructure of eosinophil human and mouse eosinophils. Um, one, you can say, um, this is one, the sombrero. Another one is that the granules have, although the granules have the core, the electron dense, but the format, it's a little bit different. I mean, it's more uh, elongated. And uh, um, mouse using the fields do not degranulate in the same rate and so easily compared to human using the fields. So you have to be very, um, use quantitative, an quantitative analysis to measure if they are able to degranulate, but human using the fields it's just easily degranulated. So another difference you can, it's about the nucleus. The nucleus of mouse eosinophils are more polymorphic compared and ring shaped compared to, um, to human eosinophils. I can list other differences, but I mm -hmm. think it's, I don't have time <laughs> to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I'm sorry, I have to cut off the rest of the questions for now uh, so we can get back on time. And so Dr. Gruden will introduce the next speaker, please. 
Thank you. I look forward to introducing our next speaker, and that's Dr. Jonathan Sevier, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the Technion. He received his PhD in theoretical physics of complex systems from the Weizmann Institute, and he did his postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School. During his work, he has received many prestigious awards, such as the Lee Seagull Prize for the Theoretical Biology, the Allen Fellowship, and the American Federation for Aging Research Young Investigator Award. He has vast experience in harnessing AI for health applications, so I look especially forward to his talk today, where he will talk about using AI to identify eosinophil disease features and improve treatment assignment. Please start. Okay, thank you, Eva, for the kind introduction. There's no Zoom meeting without glitches in sharing and muting. So uh, uh, let me just try to share again. Okay, so again, thank you, Eva, and thanks for the organizers for uh, letting me the opportunity to uh, present our work here. Such wonderful things about these zona fields, really, really exciting. So, so I guess all of you heard about AI, especially in the recent uh, months where the uh, GPT uh, and generative AI has exploded. And actually, AI in medicine is is, is already and making a difference for, 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 for a few years now, actually. You can see here just an example of the already FDA-approved AI-based algorithms. Uh, there are hundreds already, and we are still keep going. But um, I just want to dedicate a few minutes just to uh, uh, ask, what do we need AI for, and, and what are the challenges of that? Um, Okay, so um, what do we need? So the, the way we approach it, we have three levels to, to what we expect to gain from, uh, from, from, uh, from AI. So the, the first level is just to automate, make current function just faster, cheaper, more robust, etc. The second level is to predict something, to have some novel biomarkers, develop causal models that tells us about causality, generative models, not only ChatGPT, but also things that generate molecular uh, answer. And the third level is to have some interpretability of, of this black box to reveal new insights. One of the main challenges that we have is that we have to integrate multiple data modalities, text, time series, tabular data, and images. And all of them speak sometimes in different languages and require different algorithms and state of mind in order to put all of them together. So we, we still have many challenges. In particular, um, 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 we don't have uh, elements with structure like tables and omics data. Uh, dynamics is something that is very hard to integrate. And we always uh, in a regime where the number of features is larger than the number of samples. Um, so in order to have a real personalized medicine, we don't, uh, uh, we have to harness AI not only to do diagnostics, uh, but we need also to do treatment management and to reveal uh, novel biomarkers. And I will try to demonstrate how we did all of this for, uh, for EOE. Uh, so all of you, I guess, know the EOE, which is characterized by the um, existence uh, uh, or the emergence of uh, isonophils um, and when we, when we approach this work, we try to achieve all these four goals, which actually represent uh, the general goals that we want to achieve when we approach a disease. So first of all, we want to capture the gold standard. Then we want to infer novel biomarkers, go beyond the pathologist. This, the, the third thing is to, is to harness what we learned by capturing the gold standard and, in, and the novel biomarkers to, to have a better treatment selection. And the fourth goal is to integrate uh, molecular data and image data together to get even better uh, diagnosis and prognosis. So together with uh, uh, Mark Rottenberg and the Margaret Collins and the Segir uh, Consortium, we, uh, we, were, we actually uh, tried and successful to um, 
cope with this challenge. So I'll, I'll try to go briefly on all the four uh, goals that we have. Uh, some of the technical details uh, uh, could be discussed later if someone is interested. So as all of you probably know, the gold standard for diagnostic EOE is the PEC count, where we have uh, more than 15 isonophils in a high power field. And the digital pathology era actually really facilitated the use of machine learning and AI for images. However, although it's still, it looks like a very benign or trivial uh, uh, goal, even with uh, AI, we still have a lot of challenges. And the, the, the most um, um, important one is the multiple dimension. So a whole slide image is composed out of many, many, many scales. We have the entire slide, and then we have the sub, the, the sub uh, tissue features. We have the single cells. And so all of this uh, uh, pose together with different modalities and different uh, tissue types really, really posed a significant challenge in identify uh, single cell features. So what we did as a first step was to develop uh, what we call PECnet, which is a multi-level segmentation tool that allow us to take a whole slide image and then segment uh, both intact and a not intact uh, isonophil on the whole slide image uh, level. Um, in order to do that, we actually segmented more than 10,000 patches in a very laborious work, really just segmenting. Uh, and then based on some uh, segmentation models, we achieved a state-of-the-art uh, ability to segment and count both intact and non-intact isonophils. So um, to date, we have a counting error of less than one isonophils over a very long range. So the, the next step is to take this ability to count isonophils and translate it into a, a diagnostic power. And we did that by taking a, a more than 1,000 whole site images for 400, from 400 patients, and we were able to uh, predict uh, EOE activity based on the PEC uh, with the uh, accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity of around 25. So, so that, that, that really uh, 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 position us in a very good place where we can recapitulate the gold standard and we can have a really uh, um, good uh, predictive power. However, we wanted to go the net to the next level. Because now when we have the PEC net, we don't only have the PEC, we have the entire distribution of, of isonophils um, over the entire whole slide image. And the question is, does this distribution hold any information? So what we did next was to include another uh, segmentation, uh, another feature, which is the basal zone. And by having now the basal zone, the intact and non-intact uh, isonophils, we asked ourselves, can we generate new biomarkers that again depends on the spatial distributions of the, of the cells that can allow us to predict EOE severity? So not just activity, but also the potential of remission once the treatment was given. So we actually generated more than 70 scores, and we find, ah, find out that besides spec, three other biomarkers emerged as having predictive power, which is the peak basal zone, uh, the area where, where, the, uh, uh, where uh, there is a lot of basal zones and its magnitude, and the spatial distribution of the isonophils and the basal zones, how much they are spread. And actually these, uh, these markers are uh, related to the gradient stage of the HSS score. And having these, for uh, biomarkers, we are able to predict a uh, severity with uh, um, a, a sensitivity of 85% uh, and specificity of 90%. So that's really demonstrates how having this entire information, uh, the spatial information of cells also have predictive power. What, what we wanted to do next is to take all this information, all this Histo histological information and to see whether we can predict better treatment assignment. Um, so the, uh, the typical treatments for EOE involve dietary management, steroids, PPI therapy, and endoscopic dilation. 
Uh, and we also have the emerging immunotherapy, which will probably the next uh, will be the next generation of treatments. And, and the, we asked ourselves, uh, can we, using the features, uh, maybe predict uh, what should be the best dietary management as it, as it is the first stage for, for treatment? And we were lucky to have uh, uh, the Soviet clinical trial in which uh, more than 100 people were given uh, two types of diet elimination, one food elimination and six food elimination. Uh, and their response to this treatment was recorded. So when you go over the, over the data, uh, you see that the, um, uh, if you look at the one food diet versus the six food diet, you don't see a lot of difference. So after six weeks of diet, there's no significant difference between the patients. So in both cases, around third, 35%, of the patient got better in terms of their PEC score got below 15. And we asked ourselves, can we, can we make it better uh, given the um, feature that we have from the AI? Um, and, and to do that is, is a hard task because in order to predict that we have to um, not only predict correlation, we, we need to have some sense of the, of the causation. So we have to harness a, a technique or a set of algorithms that is called causal learning, uh, which basically tries to get rid of the confounding factors uh, that are associated with the necessity that we give different treatments to different people. We can never give the same treatment at the same time to the same patient. So when you do that, uh, uh, we got the, the following result. So uh, this graph um, highlights the percentage of the patients that got a, a, that have become not active due to the treatment. So if you can see here in blue a, and in a, a orange is the results if someone gets one food elimination diet or six food elimination diet. And what you can see here in the green is the result of a random policy. So if you assign just randomly one fed or six fed, you're gonna get a, a margin of distribution of effectiveness, which is the green area. You can also then think about the PEC policy where you give the six fed or the one fed depends on the PEC policy. And it, again, doesn't really go beyond the random. And our policy, which again, uh, um, uh, depends uh, on the causal learning algorithms uh, actually is able to describe uh, to achieve more than 55%. More than that, we were able not only to just to say, okay, we had some improvement, we can go back and actually trace the features that are important for the success of the treated assignment. And actually uh, the thing that goes uh, in both cases is actually the, the results of the non-intact uh, isomorphism. So uh, the next step is, is now to take all the information that we get from the imaging, the, the, the features that the AI gave us from the histology and combine it with, um, with uh, molecular data. So this is a very uh, appealing uh, uh, approach where we take the biopsy and we don't just utilize the histological features, we also use some molecular data, combine them, and then we, and then we get some results. The thing is that rarely we have both of them together still in many, many places. So what we came up with is actually a way to just uh, uh, learn relations between the histology and the molecular images, and then to predict uh, some uh, omics score based only on the image and then improve the, the prognosis. Uh, I won't get into the technical details, but just to share with you some of the results, we try to use this approach to see if we can predict uh, the endoscopic reference score. It's a, another clinical uh, a score from the histology or from the histology together with the predictive uh, molec uh, omics state that we call T and that we predicted. And, 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 and what, we, what we show is that uh, 
having just the PEC or just the HSS uh, provide uh, some benchmark nominal ability to predict the EREF score. Um, if, you, if, you, if you take them together, you have some improvement, but if you take a, a, our a generative molecular signature algorithm, you can actually predict something that is very, very hard to do with histological data uh, in EOE. It's very hard to predict symptoms from just the histological features. So, so just to summarize, uh, we've developed a, a model which gives a state-of-the-art uh, performances in segmenting uh, isonophils, and this segmentation translates to a state-of-the-art accuracy in predicting EOE activity. Uh, we developed a, a system that can pr predict novel biomarkers that enhance severity prediction. We used causal learning to get a better diet assignment um, and we have uh, created the unique molecular signature based only on the image to, to get a better EREF uh, score prediction. And what we're going to do next is, is just to push it forward. We're going to deploy the PECnet in the clinics. We're going to add more histological parameters to predict the more complex HSR scores um, and uh, predict also other treatment strategies. And I would like to thank the, uh, my team uh, and uh, the funding. And I would be happy to take any questions if we have time left. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sevier. Actually, we are running a bit late. So if you could please respond to the question in the Q&A box, we would really appreciate it. And with that, uh, let's go back to Dr. Zimmerman to introduce the last speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you. So our uh, final speaker for today is Dr. Pincus, who will be talking uh, about three-dimensional imaging of the eosinophils and uh, their interaction with nerves. Um, she received her PhD at the new, in neuroscience at the Oregon Health and Science University and uh, focuses on nerve dysfunction and asthma and the interaction of eosinophils and nerves. So Dr. Pincus. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Share my screen. Um, let's see. Ah, hold on. Hmm. Can you see that okay? Looks great. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to speak at this webinar today. Um, I'm going to be telling you about the techniques that we use in the lab that I did my PhD in, the Jacoby Fryer Lab, um, and that we've developed for quantifying the localization of eosinophils around airway nerves. Uh, my talk's going to cover our current methodology for imaging eosinophils in mouse lungs as well as some of my current research showing how this method is used to answer questions about eosinophil nerve interactions in asthma. So I'm gonna start with some of the most famous and influential images from our laboratory. These images came from Dr. Richard Costello um, and they pointed to a key role for eosinophils in changes that occur in airway nerves in asthma. These were thin sections taken from biopsies of patients who died of fatal asthma attacks. Um, and they're stained for eosinophils in pink using major basic protein antibody and for nerves in black using PGP 9.5 antibody. You can see here eosinophils around individual nerves, around a bundle of nerves in the airways and around a little parasympathetic ganglia with two nerve cell bodies. And this study was the first to show eosinophils interacting with nerves in the setting of asthma. In the time since those studies, we have improved our imaging techniques. We moved from two-dimensional to three-dimensional imaging and are now able to image whole mouse airways. This work was pioneered by Dr. Greg Scott, who published the picture you see on the right, which is the lungs and the trachea of a mouse that have been cleared or rendered transparent and then stained for airway nerves. You can see the difference on the left 
um, between lungs before and after clearing. And since this is a method seminar, I thought I'd tell you the exact clearing method that we use because there's a lot of them out of there. Out there, uh, we use something called CE3D, which is a method that relies on delipidation or removing lipids from tissue, and then matching the refractive index of the tissue to the cover slip that you use for imaging for the best clarity of images through the microscope. Um, there's the citation and the recipe for CE3D. I found that this method's advantages are it only requires a single immersion step. So you put the lungs in this liquid, in the hood, leave it overnight, and they're clear by the next morning. It also preserves endogenous fluorescence in tissue, and it doesn't have an unpleasant aroma, which can be very nice for you and colleagues using the microscopes after you. Our second improvement to imaging was our ability to quantify eosinophil and nerve interactions efficiently using computer software. We use Amara software to build a model based on fluorescence intensity. Here you can see a model of nerves. The nerves are stained in green for PGP. And then the computer is able to identify those nerves and create a model of them in order to calculate the distance of nerves to other objects, including eosinophils. This has been really important for my research in particular, um, because I've been studying the mechanism of airway hyper, hyper reactivity in eosinophilic asthma. So the first study that I showed you and subsequent studies from our lab have demonstrated that eosinophil proximity to airway nerves is essential to the development of allergen-induced airway hyperreactivity. But there's still a question of which airway nerves and where. So here's a diagram of airway nerves in a mouse. Um, here, this is like a lung connected to a trachea, and here's a bronchi that's been cut in cross-section. Um, so you can see there are sensory nerves, which innervate airway epithelium. And there are also parasympathetic nerves. These have cell bodies clustered in small groups, or ganglia, uh, embedded within the outer trachea and bronchi. And then they send nerve endings into the smooth muscle layer. So where are these important eosinophils in asthma? Where are these interactions taking place and with which nerves? My hypothesis was that um, eosinophils would be interacting most with nerve endings on the end of parasympathetic nerves. This is based on seminal work from my mentors, um, Dr. Allison Fryer and Dr. David Jacoby, who discovered that M2 muscarinic receptors um, are located on the ends of parasympathetic nerves. They inhibit the release of acetylcholine and they're dysfunctional in allergic asthma. So in humans and guinea pig models, Eosinophils are recruited to the airway nerves where they release major basic protein from their granules and block M2 receptors. This blocking of a negative feedback loop leads to increased smooth muscle contraction. Based on this research, the important interactions of eosinophils uh, should be with nerves in the smooth muscle layer rather than around the ganglia. So my research question, for this was where do eosinophils associate with nerves in an asthma mouse model? I used a house dust mite antigen exposure model. Um, this takes healthy mice and exposes them to an environmental antigen called house dust mite in a regimented pattern. And that leads to eosinophilia in the airways and asthma symptoms in the mice. Um, at the bottom, you can see lung lavage fluid from the animals with an abundance of eosinophils in the treated animals and not so many in the saline group. The animals that I treated um, for these experiments were mice that had GFP expression localized to their eosinophils. I achieved this by crossing two mouse lines, one with an eosinophil peroxidase or APX promoter, driving expression of the protein Cree, and the second with GFP, driven by a ubiquitous promoter but blocked by a stop codon. When these mice are crossed, their offspring will have eosinophils that produce GFP. So I treated these mice with either house dust mite or saline, extracted their airways, cleared them, and then used PGP 9.5 antibody to label airway nerves. I then used confocal microscopy to acquire images of parasympathetic ganglia and stretches of smooth muscle with innervation. 
I'm going to show you some image close-ups and walk you through the steps of processing. We're going to use this parasympathetic ganglia image for demonstration. So each image depicts an area of nerves labeled with PGP and eosinophils labeled with GFP. There we go. And then those two are shown together here. I then process this merged image with the computer software program called Imari, which creates surfaces that are computer definitions of the areas occupied by nerves and eosinophils respectively. Here are sample images from saline and house dust mite treated animals. You can see that house dust mite images, there are far more eosinophils, but the question was whether they are associating specifically with parasympathetic nerves, and if so, whether it's with the cell bodies or the nerve endings. So IMARA software allows me to compute the total number of eosinophils and the shortest distance from each eosinophil to an airway nerve. If an eosinophil is touching a nerve, as is the case for many of the ones you can see on the image here, the distance from eosinophil to nerve is zero. I then quantify the distribution of eosinophils, what proportion of them are touching nerves, and what percentage are in close proximity uh, to see whether eosinophils are associating more with cell bodies or nerve endings. My results are shown here. So going from left to right, there are increased total eosinophils in house dust mite treated mice as expected, um, and also more eosinophils touching nerves. The calculation that would be much harder to do without this method is shown on the graph on the right. This is a cumulative distribution analysis, which shows that the percentage of eosinophils touching nerve endings was also greater in the house dust mite group. And there was an overall increase in proximity of eosinophils to nerves represented by a shift in the curve. In contrast, around parasympathetic ganglia or cell bodies, although there were still more total eosinophils and even more eosinophils touching nerves, there was no shift in the curve showing increased proximity in proportion to the number of eosinophils. So eosinophils appear to be associating around parasympathetic nerve endings, not in the cell bodies themselves. In summary, in a house dust mite model of asthma, eosinophils cluster around parasympathetic nerve endings more so than other areas of airway nerves. Uh, furthermore, this imaging and analysis method gives us the opportunity to study eosinophil nerve interactions in other asthma models and also treatment conditions. Thank you so much to my lab for support of this work, um, especially my primary mentor, David Jacoby, my mentors, Allison Fryer and Matt Drake, who invited me to give this talk. And then also some special recognition to Nicole Capel, who developed the Amaris quantification part of this protocol, and Aubrey Pierce, who worked with me on imaging and quantification. And thank you to everybody for listening. I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Pincus. I would kindly uh, ask you to take any questions offline because we are really running out of time. And in the end, I would just like to thank all the presenters once again uh, for all your great talks and the stimulating discussions. And I would also like to thank all the participants. Uh, the full webinar recording will be available on demand uh, if you need it. And please also be on the lookout for the post webinar survey. We look forward and would appreciate your feedback in order to make these webinars better for you in the future. Uh, thank you again and have a nice day and see you next time.